Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Dave Ocker is the Vice Chairman and Prophet and Professor Emeritus of the Berkeley Haas School of Business. He was recently named to the New York American Marketing Association's Marketing Hall of Fame. He has over 100 articles and 17 books that have sold well over a million copies and include Ocker on branding and his latest book, Creating Signature Stories. And that's what Dave will be sharing with us today. So Dave, we're really pleased to have you. Uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. I'm having trouble uh, getting this thing up that I had running perfectly a few minutes ago. It's asking me for a conference phone number and access code and a login. And uh, so um, if you've got any quick suggestions, otherwise we'll just let you run the slide. Yep, you should be looking for a separate window with the green icon, so probably not the one you're looking at right now. All right, um, you can look on the bottom of your computer and look for a green icon. It's um, probably in a separate window. Uh, it, it's conference controls. It says show chat modifications. Uh, yeah, I think I got it. That was that was terrific. All right, good, good. Anyway, I'm glad to be here. I'm a uh, long-term uh, admirer and supporter of MSI. You know, it brings academia to real problems. It, it helps firms uh, influence research and and uh, get access to cutting edge. Um, uh, research it's just it's just such a win-win so anyway I'm pleased to to be here um, at, at this webinar and this is the one I'm going to be talking about my uh, concepts around signature stories and in, in the book creating signature stories let me start out by why I wrote the book in the first place uh, one reason is that uh, uh, the importance of strategic messaging internally and externally has never been greater. I mean, employees are looking for meaning in their professional life. And and customers, at least a good portion of them, uh, are looking for relationships that go beyond functional benefits. And to, to uh, get there, you really need to communicate things like organizational values um, and uh, uh, Value propositions and and brand visions, and uh, and second of all, uh, it's it's so difficult to break through the clutter now, and uh, you you couple the media clutter with with disinterested audience members. I mean, whether they're employees or customers, they really don't care about your brand, your offering, your firm. They just they care about other things. And even if they get a message through to them, they're very skeptical. Um, they're, they're, they counter-argue. And uh, so in the face of those two challenges, we have the power of stories. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing short of phenomenal. You know, if you, if you compare stories to facts, which is the efficient way to communicate, stories – uh, are better at attracting attention, changing perceptions, persuading, inspiring, energizing. And I'm not talking about 20% better. I'm talking about 200% better, 300% better. It's just it's just astounding when you look at the data and the research studies that have done in in uh, psychology, communications, and marketing. So um, into this context. I developed the concept of a signature story. And there's really three elements uh, to a signature story. It's first of all about a once and about a time account of an event or an expertise. It is not a set of facts. And uh, for a long time I wrestled uh, with the help of my daughter Jennifer to try to figure out what is not a story because people would say, what is your brand story? and they give you a bullet point list of five facts. Well, that's not a signature story. That's not the kind of story we're talking about. Second, it, uh, it intrigues and involves to such a level it just breaks out of the clutter uh, and the disinterest as, as a wow factor. Now, this wow factor can come from many different sources. It can come from being entertaining, unusual, or informative. It can come from having an emotional connection. It can come from an intriguing 
plot or characters. There's no checklist of things that uh, the more checks, the better the the story. That's not the way it works. You just have to have a story that pops on some dimension. Three, it has to have an authentic strategic message that's uh, that's implied. And um, to be authentic is really important. And, and here's my definition of authenticity. If the audience member uh, it has uh, in his mind concepts like phony, contrived, selling, then it's not authentic. It doesn't have to be real, but it can't engender those kinds of thoughts. So what I want to do next is to look at five signature stories. And in doing so, try to illustrate the power of signature stories, how they work, and some of the challenges in uh, in developing them. First, signature stories can help you deliver self-expressive or social music or uh, benefits. And uh, let me tell you the story of the U.S. School of Music. It's uh, it's quite amazing. There was a copywriter by the name of John Caples, who in 1929, he was only one year on the job, but he was asked to create an ad for a correspondence course. And and this print ad is, is almost always in the conversation if you ask, what are the top five or ten print ads ever made? It, the headline says it all. They laughed when I sat down at the piano. And in the copy, you see things like uh, somebody muttering to the other, can he really play? Oh, heavens no. He's just up to his old tricks. So there's a lot of uh, sort of scorn and ridicule. But when I started to play, then you see this the guy and you, you read about how he uh, gets really into the list uh, concerto he's playing and and how the ridicule turned to applause. Um, so if, if you compare this to a normal fact-based ad, U.S. school is saying, you know, no teacher needed. Well, well, duh. And you will be a terrific player and be admired. Well, yeah, sure, of course. Um, uh, let me make another comment about the... Uh, uh, the uh, the ad, and that is how, how vivid it is. Uh, if you look at the, the detail, there's a very long print ad. At one point it says, with mock dignity, I drew out a silk handkerchief and lightly dusted off the keys. Then I rose and gave the revolving piano school a ter- quarter of a turn. So he, he, he presented the R of being a concert pianist at this party, and uh, you see that with, with such detail that you can just manage it. So vivid detail can help you create a, uh, uh, you know, can can draw you in, make you more involved, because you can put your, you can picture what's actually going on. But also, if you leave things out, that can also draw people in, because then it allows the audience to fill in the gaps. There was a famous six-word story told by Ernest Hemingway. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. You can kind of picture the mother that uh, lost her baby. You can picture the the new mother that's going to put those shoes on a on a cute little baby. So you 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 also have the challenge of filling in gaps. So as I said before, there's no rule of thumb in creating effective stories. You really have to just get, get something that clicks. But anyway, the U.S. School of Music is a uh, is a case study in how you can create with just a print ad self-expressive benefits. This this person that really um, you know excelled, he overcome an amazing challenge, and social benefits. He not only got um, accepted, he became a valued member of a social group. The second story is Barclays. It shows how signature stories can really change perceptions. Um, Barclays, in 2002, we had, of course, a financial meltdown, and a lot of organizations got blamed for that.
Barclays was at the top of the list. Um, it, it's in part because of its role in the LIBOR uh, interest rate scandal. In 2012, it was actually, by uh, quantitative surveys, the least trusted major UK bank, bank in the least trusted industry. That's quite a position. So in 2013, Barclays decided we have to do something about that. They created a new purpose, help people achieve their ambitions, and they unleashed their whole uh, set of employees to create programs to help people, to help communities, and to fulfill that purpose. These people uh, generated about 40 programs, an amazing uh, response, of so much energy, so much activity, so much meaning in their lives. And one of these programs is called Digital Eagles, taught the public how to thrive in a digital world. It started out with 17 people that were going to try to educate their fellow employees, but it grew to 17,000 employees that uh, help people in all sorts of situations. They'd have uh, tea and learn sessions in the branches. They'd make house calls. And um, one of the people they touched was named Steve Rich. And, uh, and he uh, uh, was really interested in, in football, we call it soccer, and, um, but he couldn't play because of an injury. Then he discovered walking football. No running, no contact, six per side, and he was hooked. And he wanted to share the uh, this this passion with others. He wanted to raise interest in the sport. He wanted to connect people with teams. He wanted to organize a national tournament. And to do that, he needed the help of Digital Eagles. So they they came to help him. They helped him set up a website to do all that. And and uh, there's a video on that topic. You go to Barclays Digital Eagles on YouTube. You can see it. And you see his wife uh, describing how this has re-energized his whole life, created meaning and so on for him and others that now play uh, walking football. So what happened? 20 months into the program, trust was up 33%. Six times the prior advertising, which was fact-based, it didn't do anything. Consideration was up 130%, five times the prior advertising. So what we have here is a, a real field experiment that demonstrates really dramatically the power of stories over facts to, uh, to change perception. Uh, it's a it's a rare situation. We've got a lot of lab studies, a lot of theories, but this is an actual field experiment. In addition, there was 5,000 positive mentions in press. And before that, it was if you uh, had uh, Barclays in the press, it was not at all positive. So how did this happen? How do signature stories change perception? Well, they they do it in three ways. First. Stories gain attention, uh, and we have numerous studies to do that. If you say something like, uh, you know, it was a, a rainy Friday morning in in uh, in Ohio when uh, uh, when somebody sat down in his telephone and wrote the most, or in his, in his typewriter and wrote the most important marketing memo ever, ever you you perk up your ears. You know, you you're drawn in. Second, it distracts from counter-arguing, and we also know this from countless studies. If you, if you, if Barclays would say, we have a program to change, to fix it, we're not going to do this LIBOR thing ever again. We're going we're gonna to be as, as pure as any firm you know. Well, people are going to say, you know, you know, this is the same people, same organization, same issue. They're going to change, and there's going to be counter-arguing. You don't counter-argue with a story about Steve Rich. The third thing is it's going to create liking and feelings that are transformed for the brand. And in a, a half a century of research uh, from MSI academics and many others in, in, in the industry, there's one, the, 
I say the most robust empirical finding we have is that if you like the ad, you're more likely to increase your liking for the brand than decrease it. There's a, a, a causal relationship between liking the ad and liking the brand. It's so robust, hundreds and hundreds of studies. I've done three studies myself, uh, quantitative analytical studies with big databases that I've proved this several times. Um, and and so if you like the ad, you like Steve Rich, you like his relationship with his wife, you like what he's done uh, to, to uh, revitalize his life and that of others, if that gives you a good feeling, it's likely to be transferred to the brand. So let me uh, now turn to what challenges face uh, developing signature stories in, in a B2B setting. Because you don't have that emotional connection very likely. It's, it's, it's more likely to be more logical, rational, factual case study. Now, Profit has uh, something like 75 signature stories all around case experiences. One of them is around T-Mobile, who uh, in, in 2012 was losing 4.5 million subscribers a year and uh, was a fourth place uh, player and, and thinking. And they came up with a solution, the Uncarrier. Uh, helped by some research and, and uh, consulting from Profit. It had no contract, no plan. You could upgrade twice a year. And uh, it completely transformed the industry And uh, because people hated those contracts. As a result, in the next 18 months after they started this new program, 22.5 million joined. Uh, they 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 became the number three player. They passed Sprint. It was a remarkable thing. So let's take a look now with that context into the challenges facing B2B marketing. First of all, to be intriguing is, is different because you you uh, really, uh, you know, you're not going to probably have that emotional thing like we saw in the, in the piano player. You're going to... Uh, you're going to have to punch up your uh, your story some other way. And, and three ways you can do that is to punch up the problem. It's really good if you have a, a you know, a, a firm or a business that's really sick, that's maybe in the danger of going out of business. And, of course, uh, T-Mobile was, was, uh, was in almost that category. It helps that the solution is so creative, so intriguing, so transformational that you got to talk about it. That also was true with T-Mobile. And then it's, it's uh, also uh, good to have an outcome that's quantitative and dramatic. And that was the case of T-Mobile as well. So um, that's the... Uh, 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 one element. Another is how to be relevant, uh, because being involving is different in a B2B case. To be involving is really to be relevant. So if if the audience can say, yeah, I, I have a problem like that. Yeah, that that's it, it's my industry. Yeah, I, it, it's even the firm is is similar to mine has same same issues. Then it's relevant to them. And uh, and the B2B really has to deal with story overload. Story overload occurs in a lot of places, but B2B, when you have a bunch of customer case studies, you're going to have a overload. As I said, profit has over 75. So you got to find a way to deal with that overload. Uh, you can do it by having lead stories, by having uh, high criteria to accepting something as a signature story. You can do it with story banks. You can do it with uh, sort of a story architecture to create synergies. But it's, uh, it's a definite problem. Now, one of the issues in B2B is that if you're trying to generate a case study from a customer, a customer may say, eh, tone down that problem. I'm a little embarrassed. Or it says, well, maybe disguise a little bit the solution to the outcome because I like to keep that private. 
So you end up with a weak, shallow story that that just isn't worth anything. So um, that's kind of a challenge that you have to work with. Uh, the next story is about how you provide stories to provide sh freshness and energy. Uh, Nor is a um, is a brand that uh, was developed 180 years ago. And it was all about, even then, about bringing flavor to the table to create meaningful moments. And uh, that's true now as well. You see things like um, seize the flavor. You see things like rich flavor brings people together, together with flavor, hashtag. The purpose at, at, at Nord today is to enrich people's lives through flavor. So the challenge is, how do you make this fresh, you know, uh, after almost two centuries? How do you make this this uh, this brand vision fresh? And especially to millennials, because you want them to come into this brand. It can't be just people that had a good experience with their grandmother. So the solution was... Uh, an experiment. I called it Love at First Taste Experiment. And they had a hypothesis, did Laura, that, that love is so par I mean that flavor is so powerful can affect a love relationship. They did a survey, uh, a large a large number survey, twelve thousand people, and they found that seventy eight percent were attracted to people with the same flavor preference. Um and actually, one third said that if there was a flavor mismatch with your partner, it was a doomed relationship. And they looked at dating sites and found that the flavor expression often, or flavor often expressed people's personality and lifestyle. So what they did, they had seven couples that didn't know each other, that but were matched, matched on the flavor profile they had, the Nor flavor profile. And they put them together uh, with a meal that's corresponding to that flavor profile with the rule that they had to feed each other. They couldn't just eat it themselves. So you can imagine, this is awkward. And uh, aren't you sort of interested in, in figuring out uh, what's going to happen? Well, they did a three-minute video of this, and I'll play a, a portion of that video, and you'll see what happens. You have to feed each other. Eh? <laughs> so I'm not allowed to put food in my own mouth. The whole milk. Exactly. <laughs> okay, cool. Everything is so me. This is like the perfect dinner for me. How are you? Very good, and you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm Quinn. Cream. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How do we do this? You know what? This wasn't very expensive. You can just ram it straight in my mouth. <laughs> I love everything that is on this table. Right, okay. I am really good at this. <laughs> so you just need to focus. Okay. Whole thing, whole thing. It's a good bite, right? Oh my god. Don't move it away from me, move it towards me. <laughs> Did the audio come through? Yep, it did. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, uh, you can just see the, uh, 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 you know, the, how fascinating you get with that sort of premise. So uh, what happened was they put this video on YouTube, got 80 million views. On their other outlets, they got 20 more, so they got 100 million views. And not only that, the media jumped all over this thing. They got over 2 billion exposures, 2.2 billion exposures, because it went viral on, on mainstream media. Um, so, you know, talk about freshness and energy. And uh, it, it just couldn't have happened without the story as presented in this video.
So the the last story is about uh, uh, signature stories that actually provide emotional connection. You just can't do that with facts. Um, it was um, about four years ago. Uh, Becky Palmer uh, uh, Palmer Lou uh, was in Breckenridge skiing with her husband, celebrating a five year anniversary. She was 32 years old, a runner really fit, and at lunch she had a, a, a chest pain and a tingling down her left arm. And she thought, well, I can't have a heart attack. I'm too young, too fit. But she uh, got it checked out at a, a local hospital, and they said the lining in her artery was breaking off, causing clots. So she was airlifted to UC Health uh, in Boulder, and uh, there they found her heart was practically dead, it was barely moving on each side. And uh, and and they uh this is a video that shows her story and, and we'll pick it up uh, there. All odds, Becky made it through five surgeries in two days and doctors implanted a temporary device to circulate her blood. Completely kept alive by machines and in dire need of a new heart, Becky was put at the top of the transplant list with nothing left to do but wait. She had a finite amount of time. I mean, they had the assist devices in. They were at the last stage of being able to use those devices. She was not leaving the hospital until she got a transplant. After 14 days of waiting and wondering if she'd get the heart she desperately needed, a doctor came into her room, locked eyes with Becky, and smiled. And then I asked him, do we have a heart? And he said, yes, we have a heart. Heart transplant, I think, is amazing because as soon as you get it plugged in, that heart starts beating. And I, I think it's completely humbling to us. I believe it was Dr. Babu who came out and said that everything is great. The heart's ticking. I don't think that any of us who've never been transplanted will truly fully get it. I've never had my life this close to being taken from me. So when it's given back to you in full, I can't imagine what that's like. Not everybody takes it as a gift, and this is somebody that has nurtured this gift and will continue to give back. The other thing that I do think about is the fact that another person had to perish in order for me to live. I do plan to write a letter to that family, thanking them for the gift that they've given me and letting them know the plans that I have to use this new chance at life. And then I would like to someday be able to meet that family and give them the opportunity if they want to be able to, you know, listen to their daughter's heart still beating. Your life, your story. Um, and wasn't the emotional connection with Becky just just uh, amazing? It's hard not to be uh, so involved. It's not hard to it's hard not to have tears come to your eyes. And it's so inspirational, not only for Becky but the hospital and its staff. And notice they didn't. There's nothing about the heart competence of UC Health, or it has to be discovered by the viewer. It's uh, it, they they can't come out of that story without that impression, but there was never any assertion or any facts to support it. UC Health had two follow-on uh, uh, videos. One was thanking the donor video. In this, Becky, you see her uh, packing up and driving, staying in a hotel, going the next day and knocking on the day on the door of the donor's mother to let that mother feel the heartbeat of her daughter. And you see her uh, at, poised at the door, very nervous and, and with a lot of trepidation, and waiting for the moment that door is going to open and he, she's going to be talking to the mother of the, the person who don, donated her heart. And then you see another video of her training for the transplant Olympics two years later. Uh, UC Health is quite a, a remarkable. They have 150 similar videos, many of them just as emotional. I've seen a couple dozen of them. They're, uh, and they're talking about all kinds of, of people, and, and it all sort of stems from their organizational values. Patient first. And uh, 
their chief marketing and experience officer, Manny Rodriguez, said, stop talking about yourself. Tell stories about your clients. And they they really walk the walk. Uh, and uh, if you open up their website, you don't see anything about UC Health. You see some signature stories. One is from uh, Kim, Kim Hess, who had a devastating hand injury during a mountain climb. And he, she was one summit away from climbing the seven tallest peaks on each continent. She, uh, she said, you've got to restore this hand to 100% uh, functionality because I need to, I'm a mountain climber. And uh, and they had a seven and a half operation and a year of therapy, and they did just that. And she is back uh, on her quest. There's a story about a train engineer that was uh, uh, had a brain t- tumor threatening his hearing, and he's back. And then there's the story of Lindsay Pratt, who gave her mom uh, part of her liver. And you see them. Uh, recalling their conversations and our mom tried to talk her out of it but she couldn't um, so just some final thought, thoughts uh, uh, one of the most important things in getting um, you know signature stories into your organization or even into your personal and professional life or even in your personal life is to realize that, that these stories are powerful and facts are not. Getting attention, changing perceptions, persuading, energizing, stimulation, action. We know from all kinds of studies, stories are so much more important than facts. And then uh, you have to know that finding, creating, and using signature stories is is really challenging. You got to find ones that are involving and intriguing that that have the wow factor. You have to get the presentation right, and uh, that takes a lot of art to it. And then you have to get those stories to the audience, which is a classic, classic uh, communication. Who's the audience? How does it segment? Uh, how do you reach them? And of course, in social media, it's uh, complicated. And finally, you have to deal with story overload and uh, and, and sort of not avoid getting to the place where you're just overwhelmed and there's too many stories and and uh, and many of them aren't good. And so you're always screening them as you go along. So that's my story. And uh, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to some questions. Thanks very much, Dave. That, that's great. I, I want to remind the audience that you can send your questions in directly through the chat with presenter function on the left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and as some of you are doing that, I want to raise a couple of issues that I, I think you um, really made a very strong case for, and that is there's a lot of talk these days about content marketing and as though this were a new idea. And it seemed to me that that example you gave at the very beginning of the, the uh, print message about the piano player was a classic example of content marketing. Through all, there was a story that drew you in. It was almost incidental that this was promoting a, 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 a school where you would learn to play the piano. That was the means to the end of his triumph, as it were. And I just let me maybe elaborate a little bit more about what you think perhaps is maybe it has always been the case with stories, and if, if there in fact is something new or different today in the sort of digital media environment that we have. You know, people notoriously have shorter attention spans and so forth, and yet it seems like stories are still maybe more than ever a good way to break through. So a little bit more about stories as it relates to the current uh, vogue for content marketing. Yes. Uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, I, my belief is that the digital is content and content is stories because if you look at a lot of uh, challenges in digital, they are to uh, – you know, to get a, some kind of content in front of a a uh, a person in a in a very uh, dynamic and complicated and cluttered media landscape, and uh, and to do that, whether you're on Facebook or or Twitter or whatever, you have to break through a lot of clutter, and so uh, stories is is 
uh, it's been demonstrated the way to do that. So then the, the challenge is to find the right stories and to package them right. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I'm, that's been a, uh, uh, one of my motivations is that uh, how do you, you how do you get uh, stories to help you with the content challenge in the in the digital context? Okay, great. We have some questions coming in. I want to try to get to quite a few actually. Um, one that's more specific. Maybe we'll start with that. Um, Rajesh asked the question around in B2B marketing, uh, if it's a service industry, you can talk about how the customer rep you know, help the person solve a problem or something like that. When you're trying to uh, talk about you know, technology or more tangible products, uh, it might be a little harder to find the story. Your thoughts about that, and, and you mentioned it, uh, early on that um, this might be a particularly tricky area simply because the client may sometimes balk a little bit at telling the whole story of how they had a problem that uh, needed resolution and yet that's what makes for the powerful story. So maybe a little bit more about finding and telling stories in a B2B environment, especially around products rather than services. Well, um, the, uh, I mean, there, there's, uh, I, there's, a, there's dozens of ways uh, that a story, a story can be sourced. One is the, uh, the founder story. I mean, the classic case of a, uh, of a hardware manufacturer in the technical space is Hewlett Packard and the story of the garage and how they did this next bench philosophy so they they're always addressing real problems and uh and they had this uh, innovative spirit in the in the Hewlett Packard garage that still exists in Palo Alto um so there's a founder story and uh um that's one thing there's a um uh, there's a transformational story like uh Lou Gerstner coming into IBM when it was a failed company and he he turned it around by doing these really transformational things and uh, and that's another company that that uh that makes uh hardware and um I think if you look at say uh the the cloud companies all those servers sitting in banks you know People aren't interested in the facts about how many servers and how fast. What they're interested in is what they can do for you. And so the uh, the challenge for them is to look and see where the the uh, cloud has made a dramatic difference in, uh, in in some people's lives or some firms' operations, and uh, tell that story. So well, sometimes uh, sometimes you sit down and you say, what are our signature stories? What stories represent what we do and what we value? And and there'll be uh, some will come to the surface. Sometimes dozens and dozens will come to the surface. And uh, but sometimes you have to actually go out there. And uh, and some firms have hired reporters and editors, and reporters are used to seeking out stories, and they go out in the field and and find customer stories or employee stories. That's a great point, actually. Uh, a couple of the questions related, I think, to that, which uh, Marilyn uh, and Hillary had different ways of phrasing it, but they both amounted to the question of how do you get your story to break through given the wealth of stories that are out there, and, and maybe to your point, how do you choose the story you yourself want to emphasize? You, you mentioned the need to have a key or a lead story maybe that uh, brings things together. I, I thought the healthcare example you gave was a great one where uh, it had a common element of storytelling, which is overcoming a challenge. There was a, a challenge, a struggle. It wasn't clear how this was going to end up. It could have ended up poorly or badly, uh, and somehow things uh, turned out well in the end, uh, thanks to the intervention of the, the medical uh, folks and so forth. So there is that element of kind of overcoming a challenge. And it raises a question more broadly about um, do you need to sort of have one Uber story, you might say, one story that sort of stands for the organization, and then each example becomes sort of an illustration of that basic idea so that you're not really telling a different story each time. Your thoughts about the need to have a kind of a, a single coherent story that unites these different uh, examples? Yeah, there, uh, there, uh, almost everybody doesn't have one story. Almost everybody has a series of stories. So, uh, um, and and it's kind of like 
solving the brand portfolio st- uh, strategy problem, there's there's uh, all co- well, all kinds of ways to link things. Some can be stories that uh, that elaborate the the meta story. Um, others can be stories that uh, tell it from a different perspective, so you get a, a, a more broadly, more textured uh, impression of the of the thing. But um, yeah, there's sometimes there's a, a role for a meta story, and then stories underneath that elaborate. But there's a lot of ways to create synergy and organize stories, and I think that's uh, uh, you know that's something that. We don't have a lot of, uh, of of theories and concepts to help us, but but that's certainly one of the challenges with dealing with a lot of stories. Well, and I, I think your advice just now about seek, uh, seeking out people that who, whose lives are built around stories, your reporters and others. There are these skill sets. Some of the skills presumably can be taught. And some of them may just be native to the different types of people. Uh, but certainly, there there must be people within your organization or that you know about who are perhaps better at finding that compelling story. I wanted to um, have you comment a little bit further about a couple of other points you raised, which I think are very important. And that is this notion that stories sort of preempt counter arguments. I think that's one of the main reasons they're more powerful and persuasive than facts, because each fact that you may say about yourself or your product or your company almost immediately evokes the, the contrary response. You know, is that true or, or who else does that or, you, you know. so. Almost invariably, you can think of an alternative to that stated fact, whereas the story kind of draws you in, and as you pointed out at one point, um, the audience fills in the gaps. The, the audience participates in the story in a way that maybe they don't when you're just talking about facts about your company. So a little bit more about that role of how stories preempt or prevent counter-arguments. Yeah, it, it's a, there's a whole field in psychology called distraction theory. It, it's a... It, uh, it, it's such a, a robust uh, finding in uh, in communication theory that if you distract people, you'll you'll get rid of cut co- or you minimize counter arguing, and and that and that's uh, that's uh, why we use humor too. Humor, if you put humor in the story, if you have a story with humor, it sort of is it it sort of doubles its ability to distract because. Uh, not only are you uh, distracted by the story, but you're laughing at the at the jokes, and uh, and you just that much more uh, less or, le- or that much less likely to counter argue, to be skeptical, to push back. That's a good point too. Um, a couple of the questions have been uh, along the lines of how you identify a good story within your own organization. Uh, and specifically, one of the questions was around the right length uh, for stories. And again, maybe given today at least the talk about people's limited attention spans. So, what are your thoughts about kind of what is the right length, or again, the way to um, as you look at all the possible things you could say about yourself? How do you begin to zero in on the story that's going to be most compelling? There's just no rules of thumb, and people would like to have a set of. 20 characteristics, you know, is there tension, is there emotional connection, is there humor, is there, you know, whatever, and, and you try to check more uh, it, more boxes, and that's just not the way it works. I mean, it, uh, that Hemingway story, uh, you know, baby shoes for sale, never worn, is, uh, is, is enormously powerful, it's six words, yeah, and yeah. you just take Headline out of this uh, print ad, and it's pretty powerful. So it it can be very short, and and uh, can be very short, or it can be very long. It uh, in this these videos, this thing on Nora Soup, uh, the video is four and a half minutes, um, and so uh, it it there's just no rule of thumb. The the basic basic bottom line is: does it intrigue? Does it involve? And is there some sort of wow factor where you you, you sort of said I I got to share this with somebody this is this is really special. And, yeah, you know, um, it strikes me that the Nora story, as you laid it out, uh, illustrates a lot of those points very nicely. The um, I think you said it at the time. Uh, once you set up this premise that people have shared tastes, this might actually be related to romantic attraction. 
everybody was like on the edge of their seats, like what happens next? Where is this going to go? And then you had this, was it seven couples? So maybe the first two are clicked, but you, you, you kept in suspense about how this would play out with the others. And maybe that's the point too. There was kind of a basic question, but there was at least seven different answers to that question that we kept waiting to see each one. You know, So the, that relates to another question around the uh, sort of the shelf life of storytelling. Uh, it seemed like, again, in the healthcare example, once they had found that basic idea, they could come up with other examples that sort of illustrated the same point, but in different ways concretely. And that gave it sort of a longer shelf life. It's almost like sequels in the movie industry or something. Once you would establish a franchise, then you could sort of use that over and over again with new stories. Thoughts about that? Well, yeah, there's um, you have two competing uh, sort of goals. One is to keep a story alive, and the second is to keep it fresh. And keeping it fresh means you probably want to introduce new stories. Keeping it alive, mm -hmm. you want to find a way to remind people of the old ones. But uh, one of the, when you get a really good story, um, there's a lot of ways to keep it alive, to give it a long tail. Um, you know, at, at U.S. Health, you just have to mention Becky, the name Becky, and this whole story comes to mind. You don't have to retell the story. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, over the, the story about the, uh, uh, the guy that took over Hi Hi Air in, in 1985 when it was a failing, crumbling appliance manufacturer, and, and a customer came in with a defective refrigerator and he went to the warehouse to find a replacement and he found 20% were defective. He brought them all to the factory floor and had his boys smash them with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Well, that sledgehammer now is a symbol of the, <laughs> of the day that quality became important at high air. It's, a, it's, a, it's in a museum at the home office. It, uh, and, and all you have to do is mention the the sledgehammer, not only to employees, but really to often to retailers and others too, because it uh, it, it 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 helps make that story live. That's and, that's a great point about, the, and you mentioned the Hewlett Packard in the garage. That kind of the iconic symbol of uh, certainly Hewlett Packard, but sort of the whole Silicon Valley industry and the mindset there that you know kind of invent it in the garage and then uh, become a world class company. Uh, so again, a great story in its own right. Um, Speranda asked the question about whether uh, stories, as you've described them, signature stories, are the same as having testimonials from customers, uh, or what is the role of testimonials, let's say, in putting your story together? Oh, that's a really great question. And usually testimonials are 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 just a ripe for counter-arguing. They're really uh, very different and less effective than stories. Um, be, uh, you know, they they just seem so self-serving and and so on. Whether you tell a story, uh, you know, take the same person that's giving a testimonial and you tell the story about his experience. It's it's uh, it's just so much more powerful. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that's a, that's a really good point. In at uh, at our company and others, you. You'll have these testimonials, and I'll say, "Well, let's let's have a a case story. Let's have a story of a customer, and they'll give me a testimonial." And but importantly, it sounds like the the testimonial from that customer, with some coaching, perhaps or help, needs to itself be a story. It can't just be a customer ticking off a set of facts or something. To your point about the power of the story itself. No, but when you, what you have is people saying, "I had the greatest experience. These people were really." You know, had this quality and that quality and the third quality, and uh, and then then at the end, well, that that's you know you you're going to counter argue, you're going to push back, you're going to say, right. you know, this probably this guy's brother-in-law, and <laughs> and uh, and whereas if you if he talks, you know, I had this huge problem, and uh, and then we did this research and we consider these options, we did these testing, we came up with a solution, and the solution was dramatic and it really changed things, that's a story. Yeah. Yeah, and it, to your point about authenticity, uh, properly framed as a story coming from a spokesperson who is testimonial, the customer, not the company, uh, it, it just makes it all the more powerful. Uh, Sela has a question about whether any of this changes or how it applies in the case of nonprofits who really have to 
sort of appeal to people's uh, emotions and engagement, you know, to solicit contributions, that sort of thing. So your thoughts about the role of signature well, stories specifically for nonprofits? That's a great question. And I'm working to put this book and the concepts in the hands of as many nonprofits as I can because I think it's just ideally suited for them. They usually have very little communication budget, and two, they have great stories. And, uh, you know, and, and it's so hard. You know, one of the, my favorite uh, charities I've been working with for a while, I'm, I'm, I keep telling the director, stories, stories, stories. And she comes out with a, an eight-page uh, uh, story of what happened last year, and it's all facts. It's, there's no stories yeah. there. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and Lifebuoy Soap, a Unilever company, they came up with this Help a Child Reach 5 program in India where they are uh, trying to get a billion people to wash their hands more effectively, which would prevent uh, the disease that causes these infant deaths. And uh, uh, they, they made a video of, of three little communities they put this program into that are, are very emotional, focus on a person in the community. They got 44 million views. Now, this isn't a nonprofit, wow. but it could be. And, uh, uh, and, and you you just can't get that kind of exposure uh, any other way. I mean, you just need to tell these these great stories. Charity Water is a uh, is a nonprofit that is very very good at storytelling, and they're uh, they create wells for communities that don't have water, and uh, and they have, they tell a story about this this girl that uh, became head of the committee that ran the well. And she was 16 years old, and uh, and she know she could now go to school. She didn't have to walk two hours a day for water, and uh, the water was now good, not not polluted. Um, and yeah, so I think not for profits are are uh, should really uh, be on the story bag wagon because they 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 need to communicate effectively and efficiently, and they have stories. You know, that's a great point, too, about needing to make the most of limited resources. I think maybe good advice to the audience in the, in the for-profit sector would be to look at effective nonprofits, people that they find themselves supporting, perhaps, and see what was it about the story, the message from that nonprofit that resonated. That might be a good way to think about what's the equivalent story for your organization. Yeah, uh, on that please. upbeat note, I think we're going to have to uh, call it a day. That, but uh, they really appreciate your your time and effort here. It was a great great story and and some interesting food for thought. I know the audience enjoyed it. Uh, so we'll be sending out a video to those of you uh, who are watching. And and if you have colleagues that perhaps registered and couldn't make it live, they'll be able to view this video in our archive series later. Uh, we encourage you to share that and and send it to uh, uh, your colleagues and others to share this wealth. Uh, if you want to uh, contact Dave directly for additional questions, you can write to him at dacker, it's D-A-A-K-E-R, at profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, dot com. Um, and with that, I just want to remind you that since 1961, Nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges.